record shows that all, uh, all directors are present. Do you have any questions about items on the agenda?
Christina, McKinsey, Sky, and Rebecca. And then we had Jasmine and Sophia, their uh, double team for second team all week. And they're led by Alan Magway and Brendan Manning. And then boys soccer. Uh, first team all league went to Jack Montgomery for defender, second team all league to Christian Perry for being a midfielder. They made it to the second round in the district playoffs and they were led by uh, Coach Nima and Chalmers. And so we do have a number of college bound athletes, which is really exciting. You can see um, the percentage there is how much of their scholarship that they are uh, getting for, for their athletics. So Mike is heading to play baseball at UW. Brooke is getting to play softball at Bellevue College. And James Jenner also playing uh, at Bellevue College. He's going to be playing soccer. And then Olivia Kine, uh, soccer at Green River. Ethan Durham, just down the street, playing football for UPS. And then Kevin Riskian for track at Green River. So that's really exciting for um, student athletes that we actually celebrated last week. And I think that's all I any uh, questions? No questions. I just had a good time watching a lot of games, like a lot of baseball games, actually. I to see the kid pitch for you, Dad. Uh, well done. Again, I think we have good sports programs coming. It's exciting. Pro soccer starts. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Members of the board, um, this is the I'm starting with the regular budget status report, and then you all ask me to do my presentation. I think so. Um, the budget status report for this uh, for this year, as of May 31st, uh, again was fairly boring. Uh, the one item, well, there's, I was going to say the one item, and then I was going to say and one more thing. So I'll say there are a couple of things I'm going to point out. One is that enrollment continues to be uh, weird, a little different than historical trends. So we saw a little bit bigger dip in June than we're used to seeing. Enrollment still looks relatively flat, but we're not used to seeing the type of drop off that we did in June, both for running start and non running start. Um, we are uh, hopeful that that doesn't um, kind of signal things to come next year, uh, but it's something that we continue to watch. Uh, and as I will get into in a future item, capital facilities plan, one of the things that we are wondering about is the new home sales in our general area. Um, we've seen significantly fewer new home sales in the Silicon Historical School District. And the demographer pointed out that there is a, a correlation between uh, home sales and the change to our enrollment over the last several years. So um, it is very possible that if home sales start picking up, then all of a sudden enrollment will start picking up as well. Um, but we have not seen that. And it could be that this is just a natural um, part of what's happening in the larger economy uh, in this area, specifically related to interest rates, available homes, and the cost of housing. Uh, yes, sir. Sorry for the interruption. Michelle, so just where my next slide was to last night on how the students have left the back. We're not seeing that they went to homeschooling or private schools. Uh, That's right. So, um, private school students, they register with either us or the state. Um, often they uh, will request records from us when they transfer to private school. We did not see that. We also don't have. 
we have fewer private school students than we've had historically. We have fewer homeschool students than we've had historically. The um, change in enrollment has been people moving out without the, the new in that we've typically seen. And moving out looks pretty normal compared to what we've seen in previous years. But moving in is not so uh, we're not sure when that is going to stop. And we've, uh, when we get into the budget, we have not budgeted for the same enrollment this next year as this year. But um, we continue to try to adapt to this changing enrollment environment. Um, you know, usually it's pretty predictable here. And it's been less predictable. And um, this last month, we lost the equivalent of seventy thousand dollars in revenue due to a decrease in, in enrollment. We also lost fifty thousand dollars worth of expenditures because some of those students are around to start. So it's really that twenty thousand. But when you're sitting where we are, every twenty thousand dollars, like that's real money, um, and we care about it, and we are doing our best to try to adapt to these conditions as they happen. The disparity, um, where the drop in numbers in June, is that largely at the high school? Is it spread throughout? And have, have we, I, I know there's a lot going on at the end of the school year, so uh, identify the, like, the why specifically. I know you talked to demographic, demographics who are forecasting kind of some of the trends that we're seeing. The, the greater why is really demographer and a lot of educated guests. If, you want to, if your question is why the individual students and families left in June, that is a, there's a big mix of that. And it's one of mainly students who are moving out of state. So uh, either moving out of district or moving out of state. And I think uh, I do not have data on this. And yeah, this is that part is fact. This part is a guess. Uh, I think some of it has to do with uh, military. They a lot of orders to come in. Um, people around me are uh, have military connections. A lot of them have orders to go on June 1st to Germany. Uh, and so that could be uh, related. Sometimes families with students stay back, but sometimes if they're going overseas, they do not. They may only if it's June 1st. Hey, Sean. Just to just to kind of piggyback off the couple of questions, um, have you seen any? Do you have any data on enrollment in like Lindsay and Yelm? And I say like as a real estate agent, I've been selling a lot more homes in those areas because they're a lot more affordable. So I totally understand what you're saying when it comes to our enrollment. It makes total sense. I'm just curious if their enrollment is up. Did you know? It, it is. is. Okay. And that is the trend. Places with more affordable housing, new, more new housing. Um, it's really new housing, that middle housing that everybody's talking about. Where there's new middle housing, enrollments are increasing. Where there are, is not middle housing, where the houses that are built are a million eighty four thousand square feet, they, those are not seeing the enrollment increases that places like North First and Uh, the middle, the median, or the one that they would recommend we utilize, 
utilized, which is utilized in the capital facilities plan, has us growing and growing to, uh, to an extent where we would need a new elementary school starting the 2031 school year. So we would have to begin building in the 2029 school year, and which would mean we would need some sort of funding source starting in like 28-ish. Um, now all of that, you know, it's a projection, so nothing's exact. That is what the median or the middle projection would suggest. Now, uh, the high projection would suggest that we would need an elementary school two years younger. And so 27, we would need to start doing the building so that we could have it online in 29. A lot of that is uh, pegged on that old Fort Lake property area. And it's entirely dependent on whether or not old Fort Lake property, they begin building the single family homes on the bluff or if they build middle, middle housing, that would attract more families. Um, and the developer does not know yet which ones would come first and when they would be able to get started on, on those homes. So I think next year our budget projections will be
a preview of what you will see in August when you actually adopt the budget. So uh, what we want to do is make sure, uh, and I, we heard loud and clear last year, that we wanted to make sure we were more transparent about what is included in the budget, um, give people ample opportunity to make comments. So we have had this posted on the website for a couple weeks now. We're holding the hearing this month, and we are going to have the Educational Service District review this um, before July 10th. We will do notices uh, in the Tacoma News Tribune for two weeks before the August, but people are free to comment on the budget and provide comments to uh, the district all the way up until the time you would, um, are asked to adopt the budget at the August board meeting. So this is just going to give a quick run through, and mostly it is pictures or descriptions of what is in the budget document that's already posted online. Really quick question. Like, if it goes to the TNT, is there a paywall on that? Or is that stuff that people can see free? Yeah, I think there is a paywall um, uh, on the TNT. Yeah. We are required to post the notice uh, in that well, in, a, in any newspaper of general circulation in the county, it happens to be uh, the only one that is really a general circulation newspaper. Okay. Um, that is not the only way people keep, yeah. get information. Uh, likely, typically in July, we send something out broader. Um, and so we'll do our best to get the information out as yeah. many ways as we possibly can. Um, for those who are interested. So uh, the overall budget for next year, uh, we anticipate we'll spend 54 4 million or $2 million next year based on um, rolling up all of the staff. We've made some reductions. You've heard about some of those reductions, mainly administrative reductions again for next year. Um, but we'll spend 54.2 million our revenue is anticipated to be $54.4 million. So it's pretty tight, not adding a lot to fund balance next year. About $200,000 will be added to fund balance next year. So if we end this year at $1.8 million, if, uh, we would end, if we end this year at $1.8 million, that's where we start next year, we would end the following year at about $2 million. So growing slightly, but not a lot. Um, and as our, the growth in the fund balance is a little slower pace than I had hoped for last year. Um, but some of that is due to this drop in enrollment this year. We did not expect uh, to drop 50 uh, students in this past year. Now we've dropped another few in June, and all of that impacts kind of what, in, what happens next year and the year after and the year after. So we'll have to make more adjustments to expenditures if revenue continues on this trend. Um, so our levy next year will be $9.8 million, and uh, I'm going to cover the other funds in a little bit. Um, on page 7 of the overall FL95 budget, uh, it talks about what the enrollment is. Enrollment is the big driver for our budget. Um, LJ, you already asked what our overall enrollment number is, 2947. The 2744 is the number of students of FTE that are actually in our schools. The rest of them are Bernie Start students. So we have 2744 res resident students and 2947 that we are collecting revenue for, but 200 of those students, we collect the revenue and we send it right back to Pierce College to come to community college and base. Um, just a couple of quick uh, snapshots in terms of where the money goes and where the money comes from. Uh, roughly 80% of our spending is for salaries and benefits. That's a shade lower than what we see in other districts because we contract out for transportation and Sodexo provides services for food service. In districts that don't do that, um, the expenditures for salaries and benefits is a little higher, about 85 to 87 percent. 
Um, so where we're higher is in purchase services. So um, you'll see um, purchase services for us is 16.77%. And when we break the benchmark ourselves against like size school districts, that's about, that's higher. Um, and, and it's offset by that same amount related to Sodexo and your the revenue that we receive, 57% is general state. Uh, that's a portion that we get just for uh, enrollment. And then another 17% is um, state grants. And that is for special ed lab. Um, so we get about $17 million. Money that can, that's earmarked that can only be used for specific purposes. Uh, we do get a lot of federal money. Um, and thanks largely, you know, I'm going to give Lori Valiers a big shout out. Uh, so thanks largely to the efforts of Lori and her great grant, grant writing. But even so, because of our low free reduced lunch count, uh, we only get about 5% of our budget, 6% of our budget from uh, the federal government. Um, that includes all of the special ed funding that they're supposed to fully fund. Uh, it, they do not come close to fully funding it and they don't provide enough money for uh, what we need for remediation services. And that 6% includes free reduced lunch funding, um, which is about $750,000. 18% of our funding comes from money. Uh, I will, uh, page eight, if people are interested in taking a look at the details on the revenue and the expenditures, that's where you would find a good summary uh, how we spend our money, $30 million of the $54 million spent in general, like for general education services, uh, what's termed regular instruction. Um, that would include everything really that happens in the schools. Um, then you have $7.6 million for special ed, about $2.6 million for vocational ed, um, and then uh, I'm going to skip a couple lines, but $12 million for support services. That support services includes, um, you know, it's not just the district office, it is also transportation, which is direct services to kids. It is food service, which is also direct service for kids. And it includes much of the, util all of the utilities out there, which happen at schools. So when people look at support services and say, wow, $12 million is a lot, a um, million dollars of that is insurance million dollars of that is utilities. Like all, of, all of those are really direct services to kids. They're just captured in our budget in a different way. Um, a new requirement from the state is that we identify material supplies and operating costs and how they are used differently from how the state allocates. Um, the reason we are required now to provide that information to the board as part of our board presentation is the legislature was worried that they would give us an extra $21 per student and that somehow would be used for some other purpose than increased costs. I can assure you that the $21 per student, the $60,000 uh, was not sufficient just to cover our insurance costs here. Um, but what is true is uh, we do not spend all of our MSOC money only on regular education MSOC, material supplies and operating costs. That is because the state severely, significantly underfunds special ed, multi-language learners, and highly capable. And we have to use some of the general education MSOC money to support those, the students in those three programs to get what is required based on minimal education services. So, um, in this slide, you can see that um, I identified school curriculum, how much we spent, $275,000 for what we're planning next year, two nineteen dollars for curriculum. School budgets is about $275,000. But special ed is $200,000, highly capable $36,000. Um, and MLL is in, in the other regular education. So all of those things, like, the district is utilizing some of the allocations that are targeted for things like library, and then we are we are we must use those for special education services because we have no choice. 
we must serve the, those students in those special populations. Do you know what percentage that is? Uh, like the MSOC funding for basic education that's we're using to supplement? Yeah, if I had a calculator, I could count this out. But we get for about $4 million uh, in terms of MSOC funding, and we spend uh, 200 for the, so 10% uh, for 10% of that MSOC funding is just uh, off the top for special programs. So we are spending all of that money. We um, are spending it all on materials, supplies, and operating costs. None of these uh, are for salaries. It's all for MSOCs, materials, supplies, and operating costs that are in the highly capable program or in the special ed program or in the ML program. So other funds, uh, our budget is not just for uh, the general fund. We have a debt service fund. We only have one outstanding debt. It is uh, related to uh, the property that was purchased. Um, we have made a debt payment, but we still will have a debt payment to make next year. We will, um, based on the terms of that loan, we can pay off early, but we have to pay off if we're going to pay off early, we have to pay the entire thing off at, in one fell swoop early. And once we get to October, we will be able to, uh, we will collect enough capital levy money to make that full payment. So the debt service fund, the only thing that is required for payment in there is uh, that LGO, the general obligation bond. And we will be collecting the money in the capital uh, fund transferring it over to the debt service fund and then paying for the debt out of the debt service fund. We're required to do it that way. That's why you'll see kind of, it looks like double counting. You'll see the revenue coming in and the capital projects fund, the transfer from the capital projects fund to the debt service fund, that revenue received, and then the expenditure out of the debt service fund. It's silly, but that's why CPAs like we get paid. Um, ASB budget, uh, I think, uh, uh, shout out to the high school and Charlie for the leadership there. Uh, they have done, I think, an outstanding job in putting together uh, an overall ASB budget, and I've seen uh, a lot of inclusion of student voice in that ASB that budget, um, and, uh, and I am the only thing I'm worried about is a continued, continual growth in the fund balance. Uh, our kids are really good about raising money, and the clubs, specifically the individual clubs, we need to be better about spending the money that is raised. And so um, that's not a problem that many people have, but our clubs have, uh, have slowly gathered a nest egg, and they need to find ways to spend. I'll just really quick to say great job on that. I know that this year was a little different and that probably dollars were a little bit more competitive because we were using them um, more appropriately, the funds of ASP. So um, I, I know that had to create some, you know, some challenges, but well done with the students and including their boys so much in the programs. Uh, capital budget, I want to make sure there's a great page. Um, I, and I included, because this will be posted on the website, we are going to be posted on the website, this is what's awesome. Um, that I included the page number so that if people go to this presentation, they can go and look at the details in the actual budget. So on 139 of the F195, the capital budget has the capital levy revenue coming in for the next fiscal year, that's about $6 million, and outlines how that money is going to be spent. Um, and we are spending um, about uh, three million and transferring about three million. So that's the three million is being transferred over the debt service fund. We're spending the other three million. And then finally, we do a four-year outlook. And um, this is a relatively new requirement. It goes back a few years. 
Um, but this four-year album uh, tries to portray how much we're going to add to fund balance, what our revenues and expenditure assumptions, assumptions look like over the next four years. Um, um, we, we believe we will build $200,000 next year, but the following year we need to create a plan, assuming uh, enrollment doesn't continue to trail off. Uh, we should add, based on current expenditure trends and revenue trends, we should add $400,000 in 2526. $700,000 of fund balance in 26 27 and $1.3 million in 27 28 All of that assumes approval of the next uh, levy, educational programs levy. Um, but by the time we get to 27 28 we will be back up to the minimum fund balance reserve requirement, or 6%. Um, this year, we will be close to, uh, 2 million is close to 3%, so we're halfway home, um, and we could go faster, but uh, we would prefer to make this slow trudge out rather than cut uh, necessary programs for it to temporarily build up the bank and then reinstate the programs. We don't think that's the right thing for student learning. Uh, we don't think that's the best the right thing for student safety. Those are the things that we think about. That is why we were recommending a slow, methodical building of fund balance rather than a uh, more dramatic set of expenditure cuts that impact students in a more similar way. Um, lastly, I'm going to say lastly, we did take a look at what the OSBI financial indicators look like. And you can see that uh, we anticipate for this year, 23 24, we will end with a higher financial indicator score than we did last year. And uh, because of the way the scoring system works, we'll be at about 2.6 for three years. The only way we can get back up to a uh, higher number is to get that, uh, you, to get that fund balance. So if you wanted to move faster on that, you have to uh, essentially direct the district to cut more. And if you direct us to cut more, we can build that indicator a lot quicker. But if we want to have that methodical pace, this is kind of the trajectory we have. And that is it. So I'm happy to answer any questions.
two years ago, actual, or last year, actual, this year budget, and next year's proposed budget. And then the F-195 shows this year's budget and how. Easy peasy for me to just combine that into one chart for you. I can have that out to Kathy uh, by the end of the week, and we can include that in a budget briefing if she approves. And great job on your years of working on this financial issue and looking at the charts for the uh, financial health indicators. Uh, that's incredible. The work you're doing to be able to build that type of stability back in this district. Thank you for that. Great work. Can I pass by? I have three questions. I'm going to ask kind of a hard question, and I don't know, I don't need a lot of detail, but maybe, and I think we asked this in an audit committee meeting too, but if we, when we look at this, it looks all great, but what would we have been looking at two years ago when we were having our budget issue? What would have indicated a problem when we received this? Because it looks great, balances out, but we obviously had some things that were you know, under the hood that needed to be fixed. Um, and I'm just not sure what I would be looking at. Um, yes, good question. So from the presentation materials, just from the slideshow, um, one, one of the biggest things, if we take a step back and see, say what happened before, is, uh, the expenditures and revenue uh, didn't, we were showing an expenditure that was not growing when we were also increasing the number of staff that we had on board, right? And on this page, and maybe on the last page, uh, no, I've cut. So this page, page seven, uh, some of this is cut and paste. So page seven, if you were to look at the full document, has the number of staff FTE that we have budgeted for. And um, in, a, in the past, that number might have gone up. You might have approved salary increases for certificated classified staff, and the overall expenditures would not have increased by that same percentage. And if you look at this, uh, if you were to look at the underlying budget document, you would see that our staffing numbers have not increased, uh, but our expenditures for salaries have. Uh, and by darn near the exact percentage that you have approved in terms of salary increases year over year. Like those are the things that um, you could pull out, and we can look at those in a lot of things. It's hard to do that in a full board meeting. Um, but I will tell you that the tools that the superintendent and I now are using on a monthly basis and on a budget basis, like we are digging into all of these pages that agree to a greater degree. And, um, you know, I think I am okay at this work. And I don't remember a time when I've been dr drilled more than by the current superintendent. And on asking, in terms of asking in a positive way, asking all of the right questions that need to be asked. And um, we have developed a lot of tools for her, and we are providing a, many more reports than um, I have historically used to provide. Uh, because uh, once burned, twice shy, right? Uh, and I think the superintendent is being extra careful and uh, doing a, uh, a significant job of monitoring my work. And I appreciate that. So, Kirk and Don Logan, I think one of the mistakes we made prior, because we had just a month or so before the projected budget came out, we went through the budget extension. Yeah. And the totals for that budget extension were not, transferred were not necessarily correlated, yep. at least in my mind, to the projected budget for the next school year. Had they been there, we got, oops, there's some number that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Which it would have been, which we can 
can see sometimes with it, like you look at an analysis of like the current year and or the, the upcoming year, the current year, we would have been able to see those things, which is why I, I talk with other jurisdictions that that's one of the things they do to take to make to take a look and make sure that they're seeing any discrepancies. So it's kind of for us it was the big yeah. If we go to extension and raise our ceiling, yeah. we did intermodulus transfer over to the projected budget.